Hello and welcome to the Residency Program Directors and Preceptors Town Hall at the Mid-Year 2021 Clinical Meeting. I'm Julie Dagum. I am with Advocate Aurora Health, which is in Wisconsin and Illinois. I am based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I have had the absolute honor to serve as the chair of the ASHP Commission on Credentialing for 2021. I'd like to share some information with you today regarding the standard revision and an update on the process. I wanted to start out by introducing you to how we approached the work of revising the standard. We established the standard revision team, which was made up of Commission on Credentialing members, as well as several lead surveyors and several folks from the ASHP Accreditation Services Division. The standard revision team also kept the full commission and the full lead surveyor group updated with regular updates and feedback and discussion as to the standard revision process. We also created several focused work groups made up of commission members, lead surveyors, and accreditation services division folks. Some of these focused work groups included folks that took a very specific look at things like diversity and cultural competence, duty hours, duplicates and simplification, as well as many, many more. But to suffice it to say, the standards revision process really involved the hard work of everybody on the commission, as well as the full lead surveyor group and accreditation services division. When we started out on the process of revising the standard, the standard revision team was charged with several big picture goals. First, we wanted to make sure that we addressed preceptor qualifications. We know that this is something that people felt very passionately about and that we had gotten a lot of feedback. And so we wanted to make sure that we really took a close look at preceptor qualifications and made some adjustments from that standpoint. We also wanted to make sure that the standard was really simplified and eliminated any duplications. So from that standpoint, we really took a close look at the content of the standards to make sure that everything was simple, easy to understand, and it really flowed very nicely. Another one of our big picture goals, which was a huge goal in the standard revision, was to harmonize into one standard. So in the in current state, we've got different standards for PGY-1 pharmacy residency programs, PGY-1 community-based pharmacy residency programs, PGY-1 managed care programs, as well as PGY-2 programs. So one of our big picture goals was to take all of those standards and harmonize into one so that all programs will be surveyed under one standard. We also knew the importance of ins inserting well-being and resilience, as well as diversity and cultural competence into the newly revised standards. And our last big picture goal was to take a close look at pharmacy services, the current standard six, and really refresh those to make sure that they reflected contemporary practice as well as pushing the profession forward. This graphic really shows the progression of the standard revision from the time that we started the process up until most recently, uh, November of 2021. I will revisit this progression slide, but really wanted to first focus on when we began the journey of revising the standard, and that really occurred in August of 2019 um, at the Commission on Credentialing meeting. And what we did at the August of the 2019 Commission on Credentialing meeting was created some assumptions to help guide our work, and we established one of the first work groups related to the standard revision process. Then in March of 2020, we established even more work groups and we really matched up work groups for each one of the big picture goals that I just talked about. So I do want to go through some of the assumptions with you. We'll do that on the next slide. So as I mentioned, when we began the standard revision journey back in August of 2019, we created some assumptions or really objectives that helped to support the big picture goals that we talked about. The objectives to help guide our work included ensuring that the standards were optimal. And, and by that, we mean really reflect contemporary pharmacy practice, advance the profession, and really support forward thinking. We also had a second objective or assumption about harmonizing the standards into one. 
And, and we talked about that in the previous slide about making sure that all programs would be surveyed under the same standard. Another objective that we had set forth for ourselves was to really reduce redundancy. And, and this had a little bit to do with the duplications that sometimes we see in the current standards, especially between standards three and standard four. We really wanted to take a look at where there was redundancy in the existing standards and try to simplify that and eliminate that duplication. Our fourth objective was to take a look at the guidance. There is so much information that is really, really helpful in the current standards that resides in the guidance to the standard. And we really wanted to take a close look at that information and make a decision about pulling some of that information into the standard, but also using the guidance to really provide clarity and context and detail to each one of the standards. Our fifth, our fifth objective was to simplify. Um, which relates a little bit into the reducing redundancy, but we also wanted to simplify language. We wanted to make sure that we kept what adds value and improves quality in residency training and make this standard very simple and easy to understand. And as I mentioned before as well, um, another one of our objectives, number six, was to look at preceptor qualifications and really address, again, the concerns and the feedback that we had heard from programs and from preceptors and from program directors, and really take a, a really good look at that piece of the standard specifically. In addition, again, our objectives were to add well-being and resilience and to add diversity and cultural competence. So to quickly revisit this graphic of the standard revision progress, we talked about how the standard revision really kicked off in August of 2019 when we created the assumptions in the first work group and really got going in March of 2020 when we established work groups for each of the big picture goals. But there were many other milestones along the way. And from that standpoint, the standard revision team met very diligently between each of the milestones as well as the work groups and each of the milestones really represents time that the standard revision team had to engage the rest of the full commission on credentialing as well as the lead surveyor group to gather feedback on the process, to have discussions as to where things were headed with the standards and to really take time in between to incorporate feedback from the full commission on credentialing. So again, this graphic really just takes you through from when we started the process up until the most recent point in time, which was November of 2021, when we had a specific standards revision call. And again, everybody got in on the fun, whether or not we were a member of the standard revisions team or one of the work groups. Um, so lots of feedback that was considered and incorporated along the way. So you're probably wondering at this point, Gosh, it's nice to know all the work that has gone into the standards revision up to this point, but what happens from here? Well, this shows the rest of the planned timeline. Of course, it's always subject to change, but the plan for the rest of the standard revision timeline is to share a draft of the revised standards with programs and program directors and partners and external stakeholders for review and feedback. So all of you, we really are looking for your feedback on the draft of the standards. In 2022, then the standard revision team and the Commission on Credentialing will be charged with incorporating the feedback that we get from all of, all of you and, and the partners and external stakeholders. Um, then we'll take that and incorporate that feedback, um, share a final draft for the Commission on Credentialing to vote and approve, and then have the ASHP Board of Directors approve the final standard revision. And then we'll spend 2022 also putting together and creating education for programs, for program directors, um, for preceptors and all of that. Um, 2023 then would be the milestone where the standard draft would then become available to programs to prepare for implementation with the target of all programs implementing the new standard with the incoming class in summer of 2023. Over the next couple of slides, I really wanted to take you on a high level overview of some of the highlights of what we addressed, what maybe has changed, or what we emphasized in each one of the standards, going standard by standard in the standard revision. So standard one, which is recruitment and selection of residents, 
Um, some of the things that you'll see in the revised standard one is that we added language surrounding methods to recruit a diverse and inclusive applicant pool. We also addressed all phases of the match, um, not just phase one of the match. And we added language that is pertinent to international programs because international programs are also using um, the one single accreditation residency standard. Standard two, which is program requirements and policies. Um, we spent a lot of time <clears throat> adding some clarification. Um, we added clarification to what is the minimum term of appointment as well as what is the maximum leave that residents can take over the course of their residency and really included um, some parameters for consequences. We added and clarified requirements for documentation of duty hours. Um, so that should be very helpful to programs to see what's required to be documented. We also clarified expectations for minimum completion requirements of the residency program, including um, specifying the percentage of achieved for the residency and rating scales and definitions, all that can be set by the program as well as included requirements for deliverables that are related to this specific competency areas, goals, and objectives. We also clarified the required residency policies and other documentation, and we included information provided to candidates invited to interview and to matched candidates. Um, we took a look at that and we provided some clarification to that, including some of the timing parameters with each of those pieces. Finally, we added some requirements for a residency manual as well as financial support and resources, and we added information regarding multi-site and 24-month programs. Standard three is really where we get into the meat of the residency program. It is design, structure, and conduct of the residency program. So some of the things that we really looked at through the harmonization process, we looked at some of the differences that currently exist between the PGY-1 PharmC, PGY-1 Community-Based PharmC, PGY-1 Managed Care, and PGY-2 programs, and really took a look at what each of those standards currently have and brought them into a harmonized single standard. So in standard three, you'll see an emphasis on depth and breadth of experiences for the resident. Um, for residency programs that are involved in direct patient care, there's definitely an emphasis on patient care. We also clarified the relationship between the CAGOs and the standard, um, so that is a little bit more apparent in standard three. We added expectations for completing and tracking of the required CAGOs appendix. So for programs that have an appendix with the CAGOs, we now have a standard that relates back specifically to what you need to do with that CAGOs appendix. We took a really close look and, and really a deep dive at development plans. Um, we looked at every aspect of that. We looked at the timing of development plans. We looked at resident progression. We looked at the utility of, of development plans. We looked at how to better link those development plans back to supporting the CAGOs as well as looking at development plans as an opportunity for some self-assessment from the resident um, and really to help teach some of the concepts of continuous professional development. So from that standpoint, we really took a deep dive into development plans to try to make them um, very helpful, very clear, and um, a lot of good aspects with that. We also clarified expectations for program quality improvement both what needs to be done on a continual basis versus what can be done um, in a once a year deep dive. And again, we really spent some time harmonizing the different standards because there were definitely some nuances that existed between the standards as it relates to resident self-assessments, as it relates to evaluation timing and frequency, and particularly as it relates to required core services. I will touch on that a little bit later, um, so I'm not gonna dive into that here, um, but really spent some time harmonizing a lot of these big aspects of the standard. Standard four and the corresponding academic and professional record is the standard I think that is near and dear to all of our hearts because that is um, the requirements of the residency program director and the preceptors. So we really spent a lot of time, like I mentioned before, taking all of the feedback that we've heard from various town halls and from surveys that we've done and, and things like that, 
and we really looked at um, the RPD eligibility and qualifications, and we updated those. Um, we added some guidance surrounding an interim RPD, if that is a situation that occurs. Um, we really looked at RPD leadership and, and really looked at the RPD as the, the quarterback of the residency program, um, but really looked at some of those components that the RPD is responsible for from a leadership standpoint, including preceptor appointments and reappointments. Um, we looked at moving that schedule to every four years. Um, we looked at considerations for organizations that run multiple residency programs. We added some language that helps clarify that. We also clarified preceptor development, what constitutes preceptor development, um, some expectations for preceptor development. So really hopefully provided a lot of great guidance with that. We also again looked at the preceptor eligibility and qualifications and, and really spent a lot of time um, diving deep into that. Um, some of the changes that you'll see is that if preceptors are using experience to meet the category of content expertise, we shortened that length of experience from 10 years to five years. Um, we also looked at sort of the, the number of contributions to practice and the role modeling. Um, we shortened that to those occurring within the past four years as opposed to within the past five years. Um, some of that was to match up with now our eight-year accreditation cycle. Um, we also adjusted and really looked at each type of qualification, um, content knowledge and expertise, contribution to pharmacy practice, and role modeling ongoing professional engagement and provided a lot more clarification and a lot of detailed examples of what would quote unquote count for each one of those categories. Um, we really defined preceptor active practice and ongoing responsibilities. Um, we touched a bit on some of the, the team precepted, precepting experiences that are going on. And we also really took a close look at the preceptor in training and the preceptor in training designation and ultimately made some adjustments to that. Whereas if um, somebody is a preceptor in training in the current standard, we really look to see that now in the revised standard, it would require an individual plan only. Um, likewise, then the academic and professional record, we updated so that it corresponds to standard four. Um, we know that there's still a lot of utility to the academic and professional record, um, but we wanted to make sure that the content matched standard four, of course, but also tried to make it clearly link back to the aspects of standard four so that that link was very apparent. And we also did some updating of the formatting of the ap academic and professional record, tried to include more tables instead of a lot of text and things like that. So you'll see some adjustments in the academic and professional record as well. Standard five is probably the easiest to talk about. Um, the current standard five has been folded into the revised standards one, two, and four. Um, so we eliminated the current standard five and current standard six, which is pharmacy services, now becomes the revised standard five. So with all of the programs, we went from six standards to five standards because we, we folded what was in the existing standard five into revised standards one, two, and four. So let's dive into pharmacy services, which is the revised standard five. This one took a bit longer and we started on pharmacy services really early in the process. We developed some specific goals and guiding statements as we tackled pharmacy services. So the goal again that we had set for ourselves was to refresh pharmacy services and harmonize across all of the different programs. The guiding statements that we created to, to really help guide our work as we tackled standard five or at pharmacy services was that number one, we wanted to maintain the intent that residents train in an environment that represents best practice. Um, our second guiding statement was that we wanted to keep services at a best practice or raise the bar level because when we do that, that really pushes the profession forward. A consideration we had with that piece was that you know, service, surveying services as part of the residency accreditation decision is really different than how some of the other training groups may look at services. 
but we felt it was important to maintain in our residency accreditation standards because it really is unique to advancing the pharmacy services and pharmacy practice at the site that the resident is training. Our third guiding statement was that we wanted to keep all elements of pharmacy services at a broad level so that we can have all of the standards apply to all program types when possible. So there is a lot of work that we put into this to really strive for universal language to make the standards applicable, whether or not you're in a community setting or you're in an acute care setting or in an ambulatory care setting or a managed care setting. Um, so we also provided for the opportunity to, to note if something was not applicable to a particular practice environment so that we could keep the numbering consistent in the standard. And then our fourth um, guiding statement was really every time we put something in the pharmacy services standard, we asked ourselves, what is fundamental? What is unique to pharmacy and pharmacy practice? So we really kept that as a central theme as we looked at refreshing pharmacy services. As we talk about some of the highlights of the revised pharmacy services standard, I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight as to how the group approached the work of revising pharmacy services. First, we crosswalk the concepts of current standard six with lots of source documents, including the PAI 2030, and conducted a gap analysis to really consider what needed to be added to the standard, what could be eliminated from the standard, and, and really evaluate where we were at in terms of some of these forward thinking source documents. We then reorganized pharmacy services into some new themes, pharmacy leadership, medication use systems, and patient-centered care. And again, we really focused on aspects unique to pharmacy and advancement of the profession. Some of the highlights that you'll see in the revised standard five or the pharmacy services standard include in the component of pharmacy leadership, um, we included pharmacy scope and services. We included a section on personnel, specifically a diverse and inclusive workforce. We included standards related to professional development and advancing technician roles, and we included standards related to supporting the well-being of all team members, as well as our PD program administration time. And we also focused on standards related to infrastructure. With the component of medication use systems, we covered pharmacy-specific policies and practices for the safe use of medications. And we also focused on informa information technology, automation, and safety. And in the patient-centered care component of Standard 5, we focused on comprehensive care. We focused on collaborative care with an emphasis on providing team-based care and also care that is individualized to the patient in, in really looking to have pharmacists practice at the top of their license and really take care of all medication related issues with their patients. As I mentioned previously, one of the real challenges that we had when we were harmonizing the pharmacy services into one standard was the vast variety of practice environments in which we conduct residency training in. Um, so we really looked at acute care, ambulatory care, community-based care, managed care environments, and as we wrote the pharmacy services standards, we really were mindful of using universal language that could apply to all of the practice settings whenever possible, and really focused on using guidance to clarify environment specific considerations to support each one of the standards. And again, as I mentioned, um, we also in the standards tried to designate environments for which a standard might be not applicable. One other challenge that we ran into in the harmonization process had to do with specific core services. So the challenge that we had was that in the current community standards three and standard six, there are specific standards that included specific core services that are required to occur. Now these core services are not included as separate standards in the other PGY-1 and PGY-2 current standards. So our approach from the harmonization standpoint was to ensure that the community specific core services are captured in the revised standards three and standard five. Again, rather than including each as a core separate standard. So in standard three, our proposal was to move the specific core services that are currently in the community specific standard 
and to move those and the corresponding guidance into revised standard three guidance and then eventually into the community CAGOS. For standard five, we looked at each of the core services and determined that the revised standard five pharmacy services captures the core service and we wanted to include the detail and guidance. So future consideration here is during the CAGOS revision process, which will occur after the standard revision process. We want to consider identifying and incorporating core services that are specific to each practice environment, given the fact that in some cases we do have core services and in other practice environments, we don't currently have core services that are required as part of the standard. To wrap up our discussion on the standard revision process and bring it back to our big picture goals, as we look at the revised standards, there are some highlights I think that apply to all of the standards. So in all cases, we considered appropriate source documents and some of them are listed on your slide. Um, we also in the harmonization process revised the standard to apply to all programs. We think that the revised standard is clear, simple and understandable with universal language we really tried to be mindful of improving the flow of the standards, and we really were thoughtful to consider value add and what would improve quality as we went about the standard revision process. In guidance, we included lots of detail examples and application to different practice environments. And finally, we developed resources such as a diversity and cultural competence appendix, which will be some guidance to programs in terms of ideas and, and things to think about and, and ways to support some of the standards that are new. Hopefully you found it helpful to journey through the standard revision process and really get a high level overview of the entire process from start to current state. And as we look at the revised standard, we are very excited to hear all of your feedback, to hear what you think about the work that's been done, if you think that we've hit the mark on various aspects. So we're really, really looking forward to the open comment time where you have a chance to provide feedback into the standard revision drafts. I also want to take a minute to really thank our standard revision team as well as the full commission on credentialing and the lead surveyors and the ASHP accreditation services division for all of the hard work that everybody has put in um, to get the standards revision from the time that we started the process back in August of 2019 up until current state. And we know our work isn't done, um, but we're really looking forward to hearing everybody's feedback and, and really appreciate your time and looking forward to comments that you have so that we can make appropriate revisions. Thank you, everybody.